Uh, good morning, uh, dear doctors, dear colleagues. Uh, today's lecture, uh, today's seminar, sorry, about radiological anatomy of the kidneys and adrenals was prepared. Okay, okay, start. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, dear doctors and students and colleagues. Um, today's uh, seminar is about the radiological anatomy of the kidneys and adrenals was prepared by Iman Fallah and Ibn Jamal. Uh, first, we will talk about the kidneys, ureter, and then adrenal glands. <clears throat> the kidneys. The kidneys are paired retroperitoneal organ that lie at the level of T12 to L3 vertebral bodies. They lie obliquely with their upper pole more medial and more posterior than the lower pole. The kidneys measures about 10 to 15 cm in length the left being commonly 1.5 cm longer than the right. Their size approximately that of the three and a half lumbar vertebrae and their associated discs on radiograph. The kidneys uh, on coronal cross section, each kidney is seen to have an outer cortex and inner medulla. You see on the figure, it is an outer cortex and inside we have inner medulla. Extension of the cortex centrally as a column of burden separates the medulla into pyramid. Here, the cortex have been extended in between the renal pyramid and uh, it's called a column of, of Burton and separate, uh, generating a pyramid in the renal medulla. Uh, who is a piece is projecting into the calyces and called papillae. These are the papillaries. Here it's showing how the kidney is composed of these two parts. The pelvic calicial system, there are usually seven pairs of minor calyces, each pair having an anterior and posterior calyx. The minor calyx pair combine to form two or three major calyces, which in turn drain via their infundibula to the pelvis. So here we have a minor calyces, they generate a major calyx and renal pelvis, and then going to become a ureter later on. This arrangement is quite variable, but when there are two infundibula, these usually drain four pair of calyces from upper pole and three pairs from the lower. When there are three infundibula, there are usually three pairs of upper pole calyces and two sets of the two pairs of the calyces draining the mid polar region and the lower pole. This is an example of the normal variant. This is called an extra renal pelvis. Uh, refers to the presence of the renal pelvis outside the confines of the renal hilum. Here we see the renal pelvis on the right side. Normal is within the confines or the area of the renal hilum, while on the other side, it's outside the renal hilum. It is a normal anatomical variant present in 10% of the population. An ultrasound will show an extra renal pelvis, usually appears dilated. Uh, it may suggest obstructive pathology, but subsequent investigation with CT usually clarify a false interpretation on ultrasound. Here on ultrasound appears the left kidney. Uh, it's look, the renal pelvis looks dilated, but the right is normal. But when we do subsequent investigation, we will find out that this is a normal variant and is called an extra renal pelvis. The renal hilum, the right renal hilum is on the level of L1, L2 vertebral level. The left renal hilum is at the level of L1 vertebral level. Uh, we have structures in the renal hilum from anterior to posterior. We have renal vein, the most as the anterior one, and then artery in between, and the pelvis, the most posterior one. The artery may branch early and a posterior arterial branch may enter the hilum posterior to the pelvis. A lymph vessels and nerves is also entering the hilum. So, so in this figure, it's obvious that the vein is the most anterior one and followed by the artery in between. And finally, we have the renal pelvis. pelvis. We have a small structure functional unit of the kidney that are called nephron. The functional subunits of the kidney is called the nephron and consists of the glomerulus in the cortex and tubules in the medulla. This drain to collecting duct, which empties into the calyx, calyx at the tip of the medulla. So this small part of the kidney have been shown to become a very big functional unit composed of the glomerulus and uh, tubules. The kidney has approximately 1 million nephrons. The relations of the kidney, superiorly, the two suprarenal glands on the right and left is present, or adrenal gland. Anteriorly, right kidney has a liver, 
second part of the dinner, ascending colon, and we have a small intestinal loops. On the left side, anterior relation is stomach, pancreas, and it is vessels, spleen, and we have splenic flexure of the colon, and we have jejunal loops regarding the small intestine. This is anterior relation and superior. The posterior relation, upper third, is diaphragmatic area. That's composed of diaphragm, 12th rib, and costophrenic recess of the pleura. On the lower part, medial to lateral, we have psoas in purple, quadratus lumborum in, in yellow, and we have the transversus abdominis muscle in blue on both sides of the same posterior relation. Regarding the blood supply of the kidneys, we have main renal arteries. The renal arteries normally arise from the abdominal aorta at L1, L2 interspace. Accessory arteries may be present in 20 to 25% of the population. A lower pore artery is a commonest and is bilateral in 15% of the cases. So here, these are abdominal aorta, give the left and right renal artery. We have some uh, specific feature regarding the right and left renal arteries. The right is usually longer and have more downward course and pass posterior to the IVC. As we said, the artery is in between the renal pelvis and the vein. And we have a left renal artery that usually higher slightly than the right and has more horizontal orientation compared to the right. We have uh, intra-arterial renal anatomy. Uh, we have intra-renal arterial anatomy, sorry. So when the renal artery enters the kidney, it's subdivided into many uh, small branches. So the main renal artery divides into segmental arteries near the hilum. The first division is classically a posterior segmental branch supplying the posterior and apical kidney. So when renal artery enters the kidney, the first branch give off is segmental, segmental, and the first one is posterior segmental. The main renal artery then divides into four further segmental branches at the hilum. We have apical, upper, middle, and lower arteries supplying, supplying the remaining parts of the kidney. Segmental artery then subdivide into what's called lower or interlobar arteries, and lower divide into interlobar branches. That's why it's in between the pyramids and lobe. That's why it's called interlobar branches or arteries. These branch into the arcuate arteries that run along the base of the pyramids. Arcuate arteries finally divide into interlobar arteries. So we have first renal artery becomes segmental and then interlobar. And we have arcuate and finally very small interlobular arteries. So this shows the typical segmental circulation of the right kidney shown uh, diagrammatically. We note that the posterior segmental artery is usually the first branch of the main renal artery and extend behind the renal pelvis. So we have first branch, which is here shown, posterior. And then we have apical branches, upper, middle, and lower. This is regarding these segmental branches. The venous drainage, we have five or six interlobar veins unite at the hilum to form the renal pelvis. So it is, we can say it is reverse of the arteries. The interlobular veins unite to form uh, arcuate veins, and then the arcuate form interlobar veins, and finally to segmental vein and to renal veins. So it is reverse of what's uh, happening in the artery. About the left renal vein, or uh, 6 to 10 cm in length, uh, three times longer than the right renal vein. So this is the left side. We see that this is the left renal vein going back to the IBC. Uh, but the left side has three cores anterior uh, to aorta, uh, cores anterior, sorry, to aorta to enter the IBC. It has three tributaries. We have left adrenal uh, vein also enter into the uh, the left renal vein, and we have a left gonadal vein also enter into the left renal vein, and we have lumbar veins that will not shown here is also enter the left renal vein and finally to the inferior vena cava. But the right side is smaller or shorter, a 2 to 4 cm in length, and has no tributaries. Uh, regarding the lymphatic drainage of the kidney, it's enter into a paraaortic lymph nodes. This uh, figure is ultrasound, is a transverse orientation shown inferior to the xephoid process, uh, showing the uh, veins and arteries of the kidney. 
uh, or uh, renal arteries and renal veins. Here, this is the abdominal aorta. Uh, this is a branch of right renal uh, artery, and this is the left renal artery. And here we have a left renal vein that will enter into the IVST. And this is to be the mesenteric artery, the portal vein, and we have a splenic vein here. Uh, we have some renal variants and anomalies. We have a situation called some circumaortic left renal vein, also known as a circumaortic renal collar. Uh, this is uh, uh, when accessory renal vein pass posterior to the aorta, uh, apart from the left renal vein that pass anterior to aorta. So we have normally left uh, main renal vein. We have some accessory that's called a posterior and they lie posterior to the aorta in between the aorta and in between the vertebrae. Here, this is shown on the right side on the figure, show the uh, left renal vein or accessory left renal vein that pass in between the aorta and the vertebra. This is called circumaortic left renal vein. It accounts for 10% of the venous anomalies. Another variant is retroaortic left renal vein that's seen in 3% of individuals. The vein may have an abnormal caudal course entering the iliac vein. So here is shown the left uh, retrocaval renal vein. Here the renal vein itself is passed behind the aorta. This is called a retroaortic left renal vein that's found in 3% of the population. We have a situation that's called a nutcracker syndrome. Uh, this is a vascular compression disorder. Uh, this is a compression of the left renal vein most commonly between the superior mesenteric artery and aorta. Sometimes the left renal vein have been compressed between aorta and the vertebral body. This is called a posterior nutcracker syndrome, uh, but uh, mostly it's in between the SMA and aorta. So here, this is an ultrasound showing the left renal vein have been compressed in between the superior mesenteric artery and aorta. This can lead to uh, renal venous hypertension, resulting in rupture of thin walled veins into collectin system, and may result in development of hematuria and some sort of the flank pain or loin pain in the patient. This is slightly greater in, in a female, especially in those who are lean and thin, that have a smaller area in between the SMA and the aorta that cause a compression and producing these symptoms. Here also it appears like that, then the renal vein in between the superior mesenteric artery and aorta. Now we have a free shell spaces around the kidneys. Uh, the retroperitoneum is divided into three uh, spaces. We have a perinephric space around the kidney. We have anterior pararenal spaces, space, and we have posterior pararenal space. The perinephric space is the first one, is the largest one. It's around the kidney here on the figure it appears. It's, it's the largest space around the kidney. It contains kidney itself, renal vessels, proximal collecting systems, adrenal glands, and an adequate amount of fat to allow identification of CT scan on CT scanning. The space is ground surrounded by perirenal fascia and is in continuity with the opposite perirenal space across the midline. Perirenal fascia consists of two layers. We have one is georta fascia, here this one, georta fascia, anteriorly and zuccarcandal fascia posteriorly. The posterior part is called zuccarcandal fascia here. Which is continue, uh, sorry, these fascial layers are fused laterally as the lateral coronal fascia. They are uh, connected via lateral coronal fascia. This lateral coronal is continuous with the fascia transversalis abdominis muscle, with the fascia of the transversalis abdominis muscle. So this is a perirenal fascia, this is georta, and this is uh, Zuccarcandal fascia, and this is a lateral coronal fascia. We have anterior pararenal space, it's anterior to the kidney, lie anterior to the anterior renal fascia, and behind the posterior peritoneum, it is continuous across the midline, contains pancreas, duodenum, and this is ascending and descending colon. Superiorly, the space is limited where the anterior renal fascia blend with the posterior peritoneum. But inferiorly, the space is open to the pelvic extraperitoneal spaces. And then we have uh, posterior pararenal space. It's lie posterior to posterior renal fascia and anterior to the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. This is limited medially by attachments of the renal fascia to psoas muscle, but it continues laterally with extraperitoneal fatty tissue. 
deep to the transversal spatia. It only contained fat. This figure is uh, demonstrate easily how the uh, spaces are formed around the kidney and anterior posterior to the kidney. The first one, which appear in a pink here on the figure, is anterior pararenal space. It contains ascending colon, descending colon, second and third part of duodenum and pancreas. The second uh, space is perirenal space, appearing green surrounding the kidney that contains kidney itself, proximal ureter, adrenal, and loss of fat. And we have the final one is a posterior pararenal space, which is appear in purple, which contain only fat. It's a potential space may become secondarily involved in inflammatory process. Now, development of the kidney, it develops from the intermediate mesoderm on the dorsal wall of the col colomic cavity between 5 to 12 weeks. We have three main components of the development of the kidney. We have pronephros, which involute completely in the human. Mesonephros give rise to ureteric blood. This is the mesonephros here, which differentiate into collecting system, forming ureter, renal pelvis, and calyces. We have a metanephros, arise from the metanephrogenic blastoma, blastema, sorry. This is the metanephric mass of mesoderm. Uh, which molds itself around the developing ureteric butt. The metanephros ascend and differentiate into nephrons, forming a functional unit, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, and collecting system. Now we have some congenital anomalies of the kidney. We have a pelvic kidney, a pelvic kidney, or a sometimes called ectopic kidney. This is present of a normally functioning kidney in the pelvis outside the abdomen. In this figure, we see that this is on IBU demonstrating a right pelvic kidney. This occurs secondary to failure of migration during development, of course, with an incidence of one over 900 uh, population or more with no sex predilection. Cross fuse ectopia is another congenital anomaly. Here, the uh, one kidney has been crossed to the other side and may be fused with the opposite uh, normally sighted kidney. Here we see on this uh, figure on this eye view, uh, this is a left uh, kidney that's normally situated or while the right one have been crossed in the midline to the left side and fused with the left one. So eye view demonstrating left crossed fused ectopia due to fusion of the lower pole of the left kidney with the upper pole of the ectopic right kidney. But note that the ureter are normally sighted. Here, the ureter are normally sighted in the right side. These kidneys invariably have an aberrant vascular supply. This is an example of the cross fuse ectopia in this uh, animation. We have a horseshoe kidney here on the uh, eye view on the uh, left side of the screen and the right side. We have a maximum intensity projection CT urogram image of the horseshoe kidney. Uh, when the two lower pole of the kidney is united, they are forming a horseshoe shape. So not the lower pole of the kidney cross the midline and an area and are fused. The hallmark of horseshoe kidney is the hallmark of the horseshoe kidney. The fused tissue may be non-functional fibrous tissue. Horseshoe kidney are prone to traumatic damage and are commonest fusion anomalies associated with Turner and triosomy 18. So in this figure, it's obvious that they are connected in the middle, forming a horseshoe shape, and also on the CT urogram up here, the kidneys are connected and forming a horseshoe kidney. We have a bifid renal pelvis. Here, the IV illustrating a bifid renal pelvis of the left kidney. The renal pelvis are bifid uh, of the uh, two sides. This is one of another anomaly. We have a partial du duplex, and uh, here again, IV illustrating a partial duplex of collecting system of the left kidney with the fusion of ureter in the distal third. In the lower part, the ureter have been connected and fused, while in the upper part, they are, appear like a duplex or two separate structures. This is called a partial duplex. While we have a complete duplex, here when the ureter course is completely separate, separately until it enter into the bladder. So in this eye view, it demonstrates the duplex left kidney with complete ureteric duplication. The upper moiety of the ureter is seen entering the bladder as a urethroceal. You see, this is a urethroceal have been formed by the upper part 
or upper ureter, upper pole ureter, with typical cobra head appearance that appear in the oral. Complete duplex system are more common with the ureter of the lower pole moiety inserted normally in the bladder and upper pole uh, moiety having an ectopic insertion in the bladder, urethra, or elsewhere. Now we will come to radiological investigation of the kidneys. First, we start with a plain radiograph. The renal edge may be visible on the plain radiograph that outlined by surrounding perirenal fat. Here we can see the outline of the uh, left kidney because of the presence of the perirenal fat. Intrarenal anatomy is never visible on plain radiograph. Similarly, the bladder may be outlined uh, by the perivesical fat, but the non-opacified ureter uh, are also never seen. The kidneys are about three to five, five uh, three and a half vertebral bodies. It's about 11 to 15 cm in length. The renal side is magnified by plain radiograph about 15% compared to the ultrasound. Now we have intravenous urography, abbreviated IVU. After we use after opacification by intravenous at contrast, the renal parenchyma and outline can be assessed in early or nephrographic uh, phase. And the collecting system and ureteric anatomy in the urographic phase. In the urographic phase, the calicial system can be seen. Minor and major calices are seen. These are connected to the pelvis of the kidney by infundibula which may be long or short. This is what we talked about previously, how the normal anatomy is generated. So this is immediate phase of, uh, or immediate film of the IVU. This is five to 15 minute film nephrographic phase where you see the renal parenchyma and outlines. 30 minutes after that, this is called urographic phase. We will see the collecting system and the ureter. And we have after 45 minutes, it's called cystogram phase where you see the bladder. And post voiding film after you evacuate the bladder, you will see if there is any residual urine in the bladder. It's called post voiding film. Uh, regarding the ultrasound, the normal kidney appearance in adult on ultrasound is that the normally the size is about 9 to 12 cm, and cortex is less echogenic than the liver. Medullary pyramids are slightly less echogenic than the cortex. Here is obvious that this is the pyramids, and this is the renal cortex. The cortex thickness equal or more than six million in diameter. If the pyramids are difficult to differentiate, the parenchymal thickness can be measured instead, and uh, you should be uh, 15 to 20 million in diameter. Central renal sinus consisting of the calyces, renal pelvis, and fat is more echogenic than the cortex. Renal pelvis may appear as a central slit of anechoic uh, fluid at the hilum. You see, this is. Uh, example of this is a normal uh, kidney that appears with cortex and pyramids and then a uh, renal pelvis like a slit. But here we see this is dilated renal pelvis and even the proximal ureter because of any reason, but the renal pelvis become dilated and enlarged. Uh, neonatal kidneys is different from adult uh, on ultrasound. Here we have increased cortical echogenicity, maybe similar to liver or spleen, it's obvious here. A larger and more hypoechoic pyramids. And we have little or no sinus fat. Fetal lobulation may be seen in the fetus. Uh, note adult pattern is attained at six months of age. Uh, so here the uh, appear of the fetal uh, kidney that's completely different in appearance and echogenicity compared to the adult kidneys. We have a variance, uh, anatomical variance of the kidneys that's called a benign anatomical variance of the kidney. This is called a dromedary hump. Uh, this is an uh, elevation of the uh, contour of the lateral aspect of especially of the left kidney that usually caused by the superior lateral impression of the spleen uh, on the kidney. Uh, this may be sometimes uh, mixed as uh, or confused, uh, uh, appear like a mass on ultrasound. Uh, so we have to make sure that this is uh, not mass or it is a pseudo tumor or a dromedary hump, which is a normal variant. 
so uh, ultrasound may give you a clue, but uh, the final diagnosis may be done by CT or MRI, or sometimes use a radio uh, scintigraphy like a DNSA to differentiate it from a, a real tumor of the kidney. And also on the other side, we have hypertrophied column of Burton. As we said, column of Burton is normally separating the uh, renal medulla into pyramids, but sometimes the uh, column of Burton may appear hypertrophied or enlarged, or sometimes it's called prominence column of Burton. Again, it may be mixed as a mass, but on ultrasound, you see it is continuous with the cortex, and it has the same uh, equal texture with the cortex, and, uh, and also the outline of the kidney have been preserved. So uh, it may give us the hint about the hypertrophied column of Burton, and this is usually quite common in population. And this is a persistent fetal lobulation. Sometimes the fetal lobulation may be persistent in, in adult life. So this is called a persistent fetal lobulation. Uh, regarding the CT and MRI of the kidney, the kidneys are seen on slices from T12 to L3 vertebral levels. Posterior relation and anterior relations can be seen on axial CT image, but are very well appreciated on sagittal and coronal images. The renal substance is homogeneous on an enhanced CT. So this is a normal abdominal CT showing the left and right kidney. And this is uh, here is liver adjacent and anterior to the right kidney. Right kidney is scanned through the liver with the patient in supine position. So this is the liver, this is the right, and this is the left kidney on CT scan. On MRI, the intrinsic contrast between cortex and medulla is seen on T1-weighted and T2-weighted images. On T1-weighted images, the renal cortex has slightly higher signal than medulla. On T2-weighted images, the renal cortex is slightly lower in signal than the medulla, and intrinsic renal contrast is superior. On both CT and MRI, we have three phases of enhancement when we use a contrast. We have arterial cortical medullary phase, that's usually after 20 to 40 seconds after the injection of the contrast, where the cortex enhances strongly and contrast between the cortex and medulla is greatest. And we have a venous nephrographic phase, usually after about 60 seconds from bullous injection, where contrast is homogeneous throughout the kidney. And finally, we have delayed excretory phase about 10 minutes after the uh, injection of the bullus, where contrast is seen in a collecting system. This is just an example of MRI of a simple renal cyst here on the T2-weighted images. Here, an enhanced T1 out of phase, and we have a contrast-enhanced T1-weighted image. So we have a series of the coronal CT image here. The first one is an enhanced. The second is post-contrast in cortical medullary phase. And we have nephrographic phase here on the C, and we have urogenic phase finally. The renal vessels can be identified on an enhanced image, but are best seen after contrast. The arteries is best seen early in a contrast bullus, as we said, after about 20 to 40 seconds. The vein best seen after approximately 60 seconds. With MR, the renal arteries and veins can also be imaged without intravenous contrast using a low-sensitive uh, imaging sequence. We have arteriography of the kidney. Direct arteriography allows assessment of the vascular and other lesions of the kidneys, but is primarily used to facilitate intravenous uh, intra interventional procedure, such as renal artery angioplasty or stent placement. So this figure is showing the arteriography show how the arteries is very obvious, even intrarenal arterial anatomies is obvious. Uh, venography is, per, is very rare, but usually performed via inferior vena, cava. Although it's rarely used, it's mainly required to identify the location of renin-producing tumor, or sometimes can be used for renal vein thrombosis or defect in the, uh, or problem in the vein. So the left adrenal and left gonad are also imaged via the left renal venography because the common drainage of the veins from these organs on this side, the renal veins are seen to have valves. These are more common on the left side. The right renal vein is multiple in 10% of venogram and receive the right gonadal vein in 6% of patients. And final investigation is centigraphy. This method is used primarily in study of physiology of the kidney or function of the kidney. 
These are used to establish how much of the fused part of horseshoe kidney is functional renal tissue. We have DTPA, we have MAC3 isotopes that are filtered into the urine and can be used to assess overall and split renal function as well, uh, as well as GFR and also provide structural information regarding the collecting system. Also, we have DMSA that can be used for assessment of structural uh, or morphology of the kidney, especially in pediatric age group. This is regarding the kidney. Uh, the second part of the lecture, uh, I hope it's not boring, but it's too long, sorry for that, is the ureter. Uh, first general feature of the ureter is retroperitoneal and extraperitoneal structure. Uh, it's 25 to 30 cm long. Diameter of ureter is three millim and has three functionally narrow region. The first one is at the pelvic ureteric junction. The second is the pelvic brim. The third one is when entering into the bladder in the basic ureteric junction. The ureter enters the pelvis at the bifurcation of the common iliac artery anterior to the sacroiliac joint. It then lies on the lateral wall of the pelvis in front of the internal iliac artery to a point just to anterior to the ischial spine where it turns forward and enter medially to the bladder. In female, the ureter is close to the lateral fornix of the vagina and 2.5 cm lateral to the cervix. We see here on this green dot, the ureter is lateral to the lateral fornices of the vagina and the cervix. It uh, passes under the uterine artery. This red one is uterine artery in the base of broad ligament. Here, this is the ureter under the uterine artery in female. While in male, the ureter passes above the seminal vesicle. This is the seminal vesicle and is crossed by the vas deferens. This is the ureter have been crossed by the mass difference and above the seminal vesicle in male. In both sexes, the intravesical portion of the ureter has an oblique course of 2 cm through the bladder wall. The vesical muscle has an eccentric action and the obliquity has a valve-like action. What the relation of the ureter posteriorly, we have, sorry, we have psoas muscle, genitofemoral nerve, sacroiliac joint and common iliac vessels, tip of the transverse process of L2, L5 lumbar vertebrae. So this shown a relation, especially the bones, posteriorly to the ureter. Anteriorly, we have right and left. The right side, anteriorly, we have duodenum, terminal ilium, right gonadal vessel, right colic vessels, iliocolic vessels. On the left side, we have left gonadal vessels, left colic vessel, sigmoid colon, and mesocolon. The blood supply, we have three major artery. We have upper ureteric artery, which is branch of renal artery. You see, this is the upper ureteric artery. This is a branch of renal artery. The mid ureter, which is small medial branch from aorta. You see, this is the mid ureteric artery arise from the aorta. And then we have lower ureter, which is small branch from the superior and inferior basical, middle rectal, and uterine artery. This is the uh, small branch to the ureter from the uh, inferior basical and middle rectal and uterine artery. The venous drainage is highly variable and it's not defined. The lymphatic abdominal ureter drain to the aortocaval and common iliac nodes. The pelvic ureter drain to the internal and external iliac nodes. The radiological investigation of the ureter, first of all, plain fill. The ureter, we said, is never seen on plain fill, but a knowledge of its course in relation to the skeleton is necessary when looking for radio-opaque calculi. We talked about the courses of the ureter, how they will come down anterior to the transverse process of the vertebrae, and how come to anterior to the uh, sacroiliac joints and intermediately into the bladder. So if we know the course, it will be very easy to see if there is any rate of opaque calculi that's obvious on the plane radiograph. The IVU, the ureter, are either, either completely or partly visible when filled with the contrast. Prone views a ureteric filling. Distension of upper part of collecting system can also be aided by applying a compression band across the abdomen. So this is I view demonstrating both ureter very clearly. 
ultrasound, the proximal and distal ureter may be visible on ultrasound when well distended. Intestinal gas generally obscure the mid portion unless it is abnormally dilated. We see on the right side, the upper ureter has been dilated and is very obvious on ultrasound. And here on the left side, the distal ureter have been uh, dilated because of the presence of the radio of a uh, stone, uh, because of the presence of the stone, sorry, on the lower part of the ureter. On CT, ureteric calculi not visible on radiographs are readily visible on CT scan, and non-contrast CT has largely replaced the, pre the eye view for diagnosis of ureteric calculi. Uh, the normal ureter can be identified on non-contrast scan, although it is easier to identify it when it contains the contrast medium. This is the non-contrast scan showing the left ureter and the right. This is a coronary formatted maximum intensity projection image from a CT a urogram to demonstrate a retrocaval ureter. This is the situation when the ureter is present uh, or it is uh, coursed behind uh, the inferior vena cava, which could be a proximal part, especially in the proximal part of the ureter, and it may cause obstruction and may cause a dilatation of the pelvis or the proximal portion of the ureter. Here are the axial images from the stone protocol CT showing a left ureteric stone. MR urography, we have two static fluid MR urography by using heavily situated sequences similar to ARC MRCP. However, because the ureter are intermittently collapsed due to peristalsis, part of ureter may not be visible, uh, may not be distended with the urine and thus not imaged using this technique. But this technique is at its best in obstructed and fluid fill system. The second one is MR contrast urography can be performed in the ureter are imaged during the excretory phase after intravenous gadolinium and is aided by concurrent administration of a diuretic. So first one is a static fluid MR technique. We see the uh, ureter is not completely uh, obvious on this figure. Well, on the other side is MR contrast urography using uh, gadolinium. Contrast, uh, we see that uh, the uh, ureter uh, course is very clear. Uh, this is regarding the ureter. The last part and the shortest part is adrenal gland, is the suprarenal gland, is a paired retroperitoneal gland, uh, superior medial to the kidneys, within the perinef uh, perinephric space, but outside the renal capsule. These are the two glands on the kidney here. Each gland is composed of body and medial and lateral limbs. The adrenals do not develop with kidneys. They develop in retroperitoneum and descend, whereas the kidneys develop in pelvis and ascend. In case where the kidney fail to ascend normally, as we talked about it in ectopic kidney, the adrenal gland are still found in expected position, although their shape may be more discoid owing to the lack of molding by the kidney during development. So we see here the suprarenal gland is present in its normal situation, so it does not follow the uh, abnormal position of the kidney. We have right and left. Some features are specific to one another, more consistent in location. It lies posterior to the IVC, medial to the right lobe of the liver, and lateral to the right diaphragmatic crust. Uh, it is lower and more medial in relation. Uh, to the spine than the left. You see this is lower compared to the left side. On cross-section, it is linear or V-shaped with a larger medial limb and a smaller lateral limb. Here is uh, inverted, like inverted V. Uh, left adrenal gland, less consistent in location, usually light posterior to splenic vein and lateral to the diaphragmatic crust. Here, this is diaphragmatic crust and this lateral to it. More semilunar than the right and it extends down and superior medial border of the kidney toward the hilum. On cross-section, it's usually Y-shaped uh, in appearance. The blood supply, we have a three major supplies. We have superior adrenal artery. This are superior adrenal artery that come from the inferior phrenic, uh, uh, which come from inferior phrenic artery. This is inferior phrenic artery, and this is superior adrenal artery. We have middle, middle adrenal that in directly appear or arise from the aorta. And we have inferior adrenal that come from the renal artery. We have a single vein that drains each gland. The right adrenal vein, shorter, drains directly to the IVC. This is the right adrenal vein. 
while the left adrenal vein is longer, drain into the left renal vein. This is a longer left adrenal that drain into the left renal vein. Regarding radiological investigation of adrenal, we have plain film. The adrenals are visible only if calcified, and, there are, uh, and they are then seen to be lateral to the spine at the level of the upper pole of the kidneys. So this is our two exa example of the uh, bilateral adrenal calcification appear on the plain films of the abdomen. Uh, bilateral triangular foci of calcification near the adrenal log comparable or compatible with bilateral adrenal calcification. The patient has a history of adrenal uh, hemorrhage. On ultrasound, in thin individual, the adrenal gland can uh, seen, sometimes be seen between the kidney and liver on a right uh, and between the kidney and pancreatic tail on the left side by using high resolution scanning. But they are readily seen in neonate and usually seen in children. This is an example of adrenal gland seen in infant. On the CT, the shape of adrenal gland on CT cuts is variable with a linear inverted V shape being common as on the right and Y shape on the left. Cradle uh, caudal extent is less than 4 cm. Limb thickness is usually less than 1 cm. Here, this is the right, left on axial CT. Example of nodular hyperplasia, nodular thickening of adrenal gland. This is thickened adren adrenal gland. Also, this is the left and right. And here also on the coronal CT is showing the left and right uh, kidney, uh, adrenals, for renal glands. MRI, the adrenals are very well seen on MRI because of the surrounding fat more easily than with CT. They are iso or slightly hypo-intense compared to the liver on both T1 and T2 weighted images. You see this is left and right, slightly hypo-intense or iso to the liver. They lose signal on fat suppression or fat subtraction technique, depending on the cholesterol content of adrenal cortex. And thank you very much. Aisha, you Dr. Tibin, but you are the Dr. Dr. Iman Falah. This is the coronal uh, section of CT abdomen with the IV contrast. Uh, uh, the anterior vena cava. The IVC, okay. Dr. E. Lafi Jabari B. Sharatish Adia. Dr. E. Laf. Ahmed Mohammed Jasim. Uh, no, Mr. B, the right cross of the diaphragm. Right cross of the diaphragm. Bad, bad, bad. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to Dr. Roa Basim. Is she a shirt? Yes, Oscar. Right renal vein. Right renal vein. Excellent. Yeah, I'll go to the right renal vein or the left. No, I'm on the left. جد تقريبا طولة هي ذكرتها ستة ستة إلى عشرة سيئة إكسلنت وين راي؟ اثنين إلى أربعة سيئة زين ليش أطول الليفت من الراي؟ يعني هو لحد ما يوصل للأي بي سي باعتبار الأي بي سي بالرايت سايد إكسلنت أوكي ياخذ وقت وصلنا للدي مو حسين عبد الكريم نعم أستاذ ليفت أدرينال جلاند Excellent. The left adrenal gland. The shape of it is shown. A Y shape. Y shape. Oh, similar to your sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. Raga Saadun E. Yes, Mr. Accessory spleen. It is splenocular. Splenocular. Excellent. Okay. إذن هذه خلصنا عندي بعد مو تبين بابا؟ نعم سعد محمد عيني سعد محمد عيني سعد محمد مروان اي سعد محمد محمد حسن محمد حسن شكر 
نعم استاذ لفت رينال بلفس محمد خضير نعم استاذ يورنر بلادر استاذ يورنر بلادر هدى رعد دي نعم استاذ رايت لور بول كاليكس ميجر كاليكس نعم ياسمين بي نعم استاذ ذا رايت ساكرا جوينت جيد 